Before we jump into the technical details of how Node works, just sit back and relax for a minute. Here we're going to go over the history of Node.js from conception in 2009 to the present day. It's a fascinating story, and if you're a tech history buff or just curious where all this came from, I know you'll love it. It's also important to the understanding of why Node is used the way it is, why there's so much current emphasis on NPM modules and frameworks. Here we go. In March 2011, a video began circulating on YouTube and being emailed from one developer to another. In the video, a scraggly 20-something named Ryan Dahl is giving a lecture to a small group at a San Francisco PHP meetup about a new way of running JavaScript on the server. He said he had packaged up Chrome's V8 runtime so that it could interpret JavaScript server-side on any Unix-like machine, and then he had added some useful APIs on top of it. He was calling his creation Node.js. Eventually, this video would garner hundreds of thousands of views and help propel Node into the spotlight. For many developers, myself included, the story of Node started when we first watched that video in the summer or fall of 2011. But what seemed to so many of us as the beginning was actually far from it. Ryan Dahl had authored Node two years earlier in 2009 and had been giving presentations at meetups, conferences, and elsewhere since then. Ryan had been Node's steadfast evangelist for years at that point, but the going had not been easy. His first presentation, shortly after authoring the framework, was given at a JavaScript-centric conference in Europe in 2009, and it ended in a standing ovation for Ryan. But since then, the broader programming community hadn't been quite so welcoming. At first, the community just ignored Node. The original Hacker News thread announcing Node received zero comments and only got eight points. If you know anything about Hacker News, that's not exactly a overwhelming response. Once people did start paying attention to it, the response wasn't particularly charitable towards the project. As one skeptical forum commenter wrote in 2009, what exactly is the driving force behind the desire to do everything in JavaScript? Is it just because we have a surplus of JavaScript programmers? It doesn't seem to me that this task is particularly well suited to JavaScript. As another said, while I think it's great that more and more developers are being exposed to building network applications using async IO, which I guess is invented now via Node.js, I think it's worthwhile to point out that the state of the art has moved well beyond these kind of callback frameworks. The reason is simple. It sucks programming and callback patterns on serious large projects. You end up with lots of routines that are six or seven callbacks chained together, and don't forget to attach error callbacks as well at each point. And as another said, I think JavaScript is a fine little language, but I don't make my server-side language decisions based on what happens to be in the browser. To think that a language required for use in such a constrained environment is just coincidentally also the best language to use server-side, where people have been doing event-based programming for decades, seems unlikely. It would be as ridiculous as asserting that we should all use PostScript in the browser because that's the standard we've been using in printers for the last 20 years. As such, Ryan was facing a decidedly uphill battle. Though most full-stack developers had to use JavaScript on the browser with regularity, many were not comfortable with the idea of running it on the server. Besides, in 2009, there was already a hot new thing to embrace. Ruby on Rails 2, and every hipster worth his weight in avocado toast was on the Ruby bandwagon back then. They didn't need Node, they didn't want it. But in 2010, as Ryan continued pounding the pavement, evangelizing his creation, his luck started to change. First, in January 2010, Isaac Schluter created a package manager he called aptly NPM, the Node Package Manager. This allowed developers to share Node.js modules, aka packages, with each other quite easily. No longer did a dev have to search through disparate projects hosted in various ways in various programming languages to find the one that suited their needs and runtime. Every package on NPM was structured in a way to make it usable in 
anyone else's Node.js project. And each one was semantically versioned so that the user could manage their dependencies in a predictable way. It was also convenient. With NPM, there was no Git cloning or setting up Git submodules. Just add the dependency to one list called a package.json, run one command, npm install, and boom. The library is living in your project now and it's available for use. This practicality made Node much more user-friendly and allowed developers to externalize the time costs of bootstrapping their projects or addressing bugs in their code. One developer could tackle one issue, let's say integrating with a database, while the other could tackle another, let's say integrating with an API, and then they could share their code with each other. This collaborative sharing model was an idea whose time had come, and it greatly reduced the burden on each developer who attempted to build a project in Node. After all, in these early days, Node was not only unstable, but it gave cryptic error messages when something went wrong. The Node.js API back then was nothing like the LTS releases we get to work with now. And back then, a developer might spend a huge part of their time tracking down obscure bugs. NPM made writing Node much less isolating and much less frustrating. When one engineer figured out how to solve a problem or build a feature in a way that didn't throw convoluted error messages, he could share that solution with everyone else. And for everyone else, that was one less bug that they had to hunt down on their own. Another early days boon for Node came from symbiosis or synergy with a small, obscure database project that had been built around the same time as Node and was also experimenting with V8 and was also being evangelized around the tech community at that time, MongoDB. In early 2009, there were a few entrants competing for the title of a NoSQL database of choice. CouchDB, Redis, React, and others were all independently trying to pitch potential use cases to developers, but they were all getting lukewarm reception. Much of the development world wasn't sold on the idea of NoSQL at that time. It was still a new idea. And besides, many devs already had their databases of choice. Ruby on Rails folk tended to like Postgres. PHP developers used MySQL almost exclusively. Still others used Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server or what have you. Why would any pragmatic developer want to switch his tooling around to embrace a new DB, especially one that worked in a way so completely different than anything they were used to, one that didn't even support SQL queries, one that stored data in a binary form of JSON, a format that was largely unfamiliar to most devs and unsupported in many languages at that time. Even developers who routinely integrated with third-party APIs had no use for JSON, as most APIs exposed themselves over XML or SOAP at that time. But in the late 2000s, the meteoric rise of social media sites started to change that. APIs like Twitter's started being released and became wildly popular among developers. These APIs almost exclusively exposed themselves over REST with JSON. So in the late 2000s, any developer who wanted to integrate with social media APIs, which was many of them, had to become familiar with JSON. And the languages and frameworks they worked in had to begin supporting it. So, as social media sites grew in popularity and standardized things like OAuth and REST, the use of JSON API spread, and soon most new public APIs were being re released RESTfully with JSON. So then, JSON became everyone's problem. And as more and more developers were fetching data in JSON, the idea of and the attractiveness of a JSON-based document store started to make sense to them. Fetching JSON documents from an API and storing them in a traditional columnar data store, like an RDBMS, took a lot of extra work. You had to make sure there was a column for every key and subkey within the JSON document, and if the document changed, your schema had to change as well. With schemaless JSON document stores like Mongo, developers face no such hurdles. They could simply fetch a JSON document from an API, send it to their DB as is, no more flattening the object or translating it from column format to JSON object and back again. Mongo just made their lives easier. But still, 
working with JSON objects on the back end with a language like PHP or Java or Ruby was still no picnic. If the language didn't natively understand nested object structures and JSON data types, a developer had to manage two ideas of every JSON object in parallel. The actual JSON representation of the object, as it might be stored in Mongo or might be fetched from an API, and the object structure that his language was presenting to him to allow him to manipulate the data. These mental hurdles were painful and mistakes were common. Enter Node.js. Since Node was just JavaScript, JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, was a native construct. Node represented the object format, the keys, values, and nested objects in the same way as it was being represented in the DB and in the external APIs the developer was integrating with. So in Node, Mongo found a partner in ARMS. Though the projects weren't linked by any official doctrine, by early 2010, their fates had become intertwined, and they were both benefiting from the rise of JSON and JSON APIs. Together, the projects were doing much more than the sum of their parts. Apart, they had major issues. If a Node.js dev wasn't using Mongo, where would he send his JS objects for storage? And if a Mongo user wasn't using Node.js, how painful would it be to represent and manipulate the data objects within his language of choice? Mongo and Node solved each other's problems. But unfortunately for Ryan Dahl, by mid-2010, there was still significant resistance to Node.js, and many developers were openly skeptic, if not hostile, to the idea. Though that was beginning to thaw ever so slightly. In July of 2010, Google, the authors of the V8 runtime that Node.js is built on top of, invited Ryan to come speak for some of their staff as part of a lecture series on new technology. But when the day came and Ryan approached the podium to speak, even the Google employee who introduced him couldn't resist expressing his skepticism and explaining how tenuous his support for this Node.js idea was. In his opening remarks, the employee exclaimed, this guy is controversial. When I first heard of the project, I didn't get it. Why is this guy trying to run JavaScript on the server when everyone else is trying to run Java on the client? The version of Node that Ryan presented that day was still bare bones and unstable, but it was maturing. Pairing it conceptually with Mongo made its appeal stronger, and the package sharing via NPM made a project in Node look less daunting for everyone involved. But Working in Node was still a lonely manual process. At this point, there were many libraries, but no particularly popular frameworks, the likes of which a full stack dev of average experience would need before they could embrace Node fully. Integrating with Mongo directly from Node, however, was still a bit of a pain and required a significant amount of work, as well as a low level understanding of Node's networking capabilities. As you can see, by mid 2010, Node as a whole still needed a miracle if it was ever going to grab mainstream appeal. But over the next 12 months, that miracle would materialize, ushered in by a number of creative early adopters and unrelated third parties who built and released projects one after another that turned Node from a strange choice to the clear choice for many developers. In no particular order, those projects were ExpressJS, Angular, Mongoose, and Node.js for Windows. The MVC framework aptly named ExpressJS was released in November 2010 by TJ Hollowaychuk. Express was, in many ways, Node.js for the masses. TJ had abstracted away much of the cumbersome boilerplate that made Node so difficult to get up to speed with, and had, somehow, managed to create a set of very predictable and stable APIs on top of Node's unstable core. For Ruby on Rails developers especially, Express was a game changer, an MVC not too dissimilar from Rails that would allow them to write JavaScript or, if they wanted, CoffeeScript, a new, more Ruby-like language that easily transpiled to JavaScript and that many Ruby on Rails developers were growing fond of. So fond of, in fact, that CoffeeScript would become standard on Ruby on Rails in 2011. But in 2010, prior to that, 
many early Ruby devs were growing weary of Ruby on Rails, but had nowhere else to go. Express gave these developers an easy way to get their feet wet in a framework structure they already understood. Another key project released in February 2011 was Mongoose, an easy-to-use Node.js driver for Mongo. With Mongoose, anyone could easily plug up Mongo to Node within a few minutes rather than a few hours. This made building Hello World projects and fun hackathon projects in Node a lot more practical. One more key development was on the front end, not the back. In October 2010, Google released Angular, the front-end web framework that dealt heavily with two-way binding, the act of syncing data objects represented on the client with those represented on the server and in the database. In Angular, both Node and Mongo found their champion. If a dev was working in Angular, it was so cumbersome to work within backends and DBs that didn't understand JSON that the project would be very slow going. But with Node.js plus Mongo plus Mongoose, the JSON objects represented on the front end within Angular could easily and intuitively be synced to the back end in the database. With Node and Mongo by their sides, embracing two-way binding became a cinch, and those developers who chose this stack quickly gained a competitive edge when building real-time applications. And because of this advantage, the so-called mean stack was born. Mean stands for Mongo Express Angular Node.js but it could just as easily stand for Mongoose Express Angular NPM. Mean quickly became what LAMP and ROR stacks had been to a previous generation of devs, everything they needed to build the kind of applications that were demanded in their day, with relative ease. For those building in raw Node.js outside of the Mean stack, Node remained cumbersome, unstable, and hard to debug. These limitations were due in no small part to the fact that it was a one-man project with a loose association of contributors and no sponsoring entity or governing organization to manage and facilitate the progress of the project. In short, to become, as Ryan Dahl had said, the next PHP, Node was going to need a corporate sponsor. In a blog post in November 2010, Dahl explained the situation and introduced much of the development community to a company called Joyent who had hired him and was purchasing the name and the trademark for Node and becoming the official steward of the project. Joyent stewardship of the project promised stability, security, and a scaled up development effort on Node core and the tooling surrounding it. And within a year, Joyent had delivered on this promise and gave the next boon to Node.js. In 2011, Joyent, in a partnership with Microsoft, released Node version 0.6.0, which included support for Windows, opening Node to a much wider audience than just OS X and Linux-based developers. While many developers build software for Linux machines, they did their local work on Windows machines, and a Windows version of Node was crucial to them adopting the platform and incorporating it into their development cycle. By the fall of 2011, Around the time the video of Ryan Dahl's March 2011 talk began circulating heavily in development circles, all of these developments, Express.js, Angular, Mongoose, Node.js for Windows, they'd already taken place. And thanks to Joyent's governance of the project, it was getting more stable and easier to use with every release. Additionally, JSON APIs were spreading like wildfire, making mean stacks in Node.js in general much more attractive and Node still had its creator and evangelist extraordinaire, Ryan Dahl, pounding the pavement all over the Bay Area and abroad, spreading the gospel of Node. So, by the end of 2011, all these forces had come together and manifested exactly the miracle that Node needed, cementing its place as a force to be reckoned with and a top-tier platform on which to build real-time applications, traditional MVCs, and everything else for the modern web. From that time until today, under Joyent's governance, the Node.js project grew and changed in largely predictable ways. In 2012, Dahl stepped aside and promoted Isaac Schluter, the creator of NPM, to lead the Node project instead. He subsequently stepped down and promoted TJ Fontaine to take his place, 
Then in 2015, due to a rift that had formed between groups of Node developers, some now calling their project io.js instead of Node, governance of the project was taken out of Joyant's hands and placed in a new, neutral Node.js foundation. This new organizational body allow all sides to come together, steer the project, and rejoin forces. So at the time of this writing, Node.js is still under the governance of the Node.js Foundation. Node's popularity has grown ever stronger since its early days, though the faces associated with it have largely changed over time. Early pioneers like TJ Holloway Chuck have since moved on to other projects and platforms, replaced by equally prolific developers like Cindersaurus, James Halliday, aka Substack, Adi Osmani, and Pateris Crummins. The project reached a significant level of stability in 2015 and released its official non-beta version. According to the generally accepted rules of semantic versioning, since all versions of Node prior to then had been less than 1.0.0, they were actually just some kind of beta or non-public release, despite some of them being LTS releases. In 2015, io.js released version 1, and once io.js was merged back into Node under the new Umbrella organization, Node released 4.0 later that same year. Node's rise to adoption has been unexpected and impressive, but something happened during Node's rise to fame, something not quite worth celebrating, and that is this. Many of the new breed of Node.js developers, those who adopted the platform after 2012 or so, adopted the platform not because of Node's runtime, its IO model, its CLI, or its API, but because of its ecosystem and the speed and ease with which they could build applications with tools like Express and with the plethora of available NPM modules without having to learn Node itself or care much about how it worked. Today, we have an entire generation of developers that know the mean stack that know Mongoose and Underscore and Angular and Bootstrap, and they build applications on Node using these tools, but they know virtually nothing of Node.js itself. You can see why. The ecosystem, not the API, is what propelled Node from a quiet backwater project to a mainstream juggernaut. NPM, not Node, is what attracts most developers. Mean, not Node, is what many devs specialize in. Mongoose, not Mongo, is what many devs understand how to integrate with. This ecosystem of libraries and frameworks and projects helped propel Node to stardom and helped the community gain so much, but that doesn't mean we haven't lost something in return. It's especially ironic that as the Node.js API has been stabilizing and has finally become a fully featured API that provides so much to developers out of the box, Developers have all but abandoned it in favor of the libraries and frameworks built on top of it. In the next lecture, we start reversing that trend. We're going to dive into the nuts and bolts of how Node.js and its underlying V8 runtime really work.